Good evening, everyone. This is episode number three. Like always, I am Runkle Mark, and I'm here today with Todd Marantet, along with the first doctor that we've ever had on our podcast, Dr. Mark Kukazella. Mark, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Well, that's just my pleasure. And the third show, this is exciting. So so everything we, we talk about here today will be new. <laughs> that's <laughs> pretty much. That's good. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And another advantage of having a doctor on the show here is that here in Canada, it's very difficult to get in front of, well, not very difficult, but there's a waiting list to get in front of our doctor. So we actually thought, how about getting a doctor on the podcast? Because then we can finally ask them about, you know, the different ailments that we have and things like, just kidding. We, uh, <laughs> we have great doctors here in Canada and um, we're just so happy to have you here. Um, and from what I understand, this is not your, your first rodeo. You've been on plenty of podcasts in the past. Is that right? Well, gosh, I mean, like, I think I started uh, doing some of these older podcasts like trail runner nation where I hadn't even heard of podcast. And then you get a couple emails out of the blue. Would you like to be on a podcast? <laughs> this might be like 15 minutes. And I was like, what the heck is that? So they were pretty old school when we first, you know, the, the technology and there was never video stuff, but. You know, I love podcasts, uh, Mark and Todd, so it's a great way. I've learned so much from podcasts, you know, so every time I'm out jogging or, you know, walking, I'm, I'm usually pulling up something curious, not necessarily even remotely related to the field I work in because you want to learn. You know, probably most of you listening to this are not runners and not doctors, and you know, so maybe there's something we can share today that will have some relevance to your life outside of your regular life and work job. Absolutely. That's fantastic. That's great. So here we are, uh, the first episode in 2024. We've been uh, kind of stuck indoors for the most part of the last uh, week and a bit because we've been hit with some really, really cold weather. Um, but uh, what better way to uh, move forward and uh, to dig deeper into our running journey uh, other than, well, by having somebody like you on the call. So thank you so much, Todd. This isn't your first interaction with Dr. Mark, is it? No, absolutely uh, not. I would say that uh, I, I was introduced to Dr. Mark uh, through the Trail Runner Nation podcast as well. And I was listening to some episodes. It must have been around 2016, 2017, as I was ramping up some mileage. And uh, right away, I'm like, what this guy was saying just made a lot of sense. And it wasn't until, uh, Mark, you, you released your book uh, in 2018 that when I was able to kind of like see the words and, and see the larger explanation and dive into it, I'm like, this makes a lot of sense. I was hurt. I was going through a lot of like injuries. And uh, I, there was a, a comment I think you said on one of the podcasts is like, you know, what, what do you have to lose? You're already hurt. Give this natural running a try. And I did. I, I, I followed the, the outline from the book. And about six months later, all my injuries started to go away and I traveled down to, uh, into West Virginia to one of Dr. Mark's running camps. So I was at one of the, I think it was a 2019 summer run camp and that was fantastic. I left that run camp. I learned so much, met so many great people, fell in love with that entire area. It's beautiful West Virginia. And, uh, since then, uh, Dr. Mark, I, I don't think I've missed a day of running. Honestly, I, I, he I healed all my injuries and it was all because of your advice. <laughs> And I just got to thank you for that because I don't know where I would have been without uh, being introduced to you, to you from the Trevor Nation podcast and your books. Well, gosh, well, thank you for that. That's a 2019 to 2024 now. So a streak of no injury. So whether it's luck or, you know, you, you learn from others too. It wasn't certainly just me. You know, we, when we do the camps, we, you know, have people that are into fascia fitness, mobility, strength training. But I think what we try to do, Todd, which I hope you experienced, we try to pass on just, you know, running, jogging, hiking. This is a joyful activity and shouldn't put pain in your body. I think, you know, any of us in day jobs, we're all kind of type A. I don't know if you use type A in Canada, right? So like everyone's like, you know, you got to go hard, go hard, go hard, you know, beat your body up, you know, kind of hockey mentality. But it, it doesn't work if you want to keep running for like 40, 50 years of your life. So. So yeah, but yeah, it's never over. So keep it going. Whatever you learn there must be must be working okay now. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm hanging in there. One of the simplest things. Like, what did you take home from that weekend that 
let that just changed your way of thinking, Todd, like what, what, what uh, yeah. thing you want to share with others? You know what? There was so much and you're bang on. There was like, come on, let's say two or three really cool things I took away. One was how important diet was. That was stuff that I, I wasn't really prioritizing before I, I met you and, and your crew that you had down there and seeing all these great runners, how they really took care of their diet. And then it, it, something that really kind of rang true to me was taking care of yourself outside of running. Like, I think I made the comment one day is there's so much more to running than running. Running's only a little bit about it. It was all the other hours in the day. And you kind of gave a lot of great, uh, and your team gave a lot of like great mobility and, and fascia release and all kinds of like things I would never even contemplated. And then it was just like learning, like efficient running. Like you can read about it. You can watch some videos, but uh, I was able to run with you and, and your, and, and your crew through Antietam and on the canal. And I, I was able to kind of see like, here's like really strong runners and how their running form was. And I was able to kind of like cement that into my brain that when I'm out running, I just kind of go back to that moment to say, how are they holding their shoulders and what were they doing with their arms and how were they landing with their feet? Not to overanalyze it, but it's just good to like, to see that. So it was just a lot of the, the little things, Dr. Mark, that I never really thought of before. I would just put on some running shoes. I would go out and run and maybe run eight minute mile pace every day, every day, every day, regardless of how I was feeling. Um, yeah. So just learning a lot about listening to the body. Now, was this and the you've era, done Todd? Some pretty, you know, you've done some pretty extreme runs since that time. I mean, you've, you've come down to our town and done like the full marathon and these, uh, and you've, uh, you've done some longer ultras too, correct? Like, like if you've, you've put some miles, like what, what are some of your events since that camp, Todd, that you've done that, that maybe you're kind of tapping in like midway when you feel like, okay, I want to quit. <laughs> you know, you're, kind of, you're like, all right, I'm not done. They told me at that camp, when you think you're done, you're never done. You just need to kind of reframe that thought in your mind. That's key. Like that, yeah, absolutely. That, that advice rang true in the longer events. Absolutely. You want to quit to way before you're actually able and or should quit. Like you're trying to, like, your body's always trying to get you to slow up, slow down. Yeah. Since then I've ran, I, I believe 11 marathons, Dr. Mark. I got to uh, the JFK 50 I did last year and I wouldn't have been able to complete any and that's of those. 50 miles for you Canadians, not 50 kilometers. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. That's right. I think it was like almost 50.1. They threw an extra like 100, uh, 100 feet or two. At that last hill at the end. <laughs> yeah, that's so unfair. That's so unfair. But yeah, like put it into practice, all the things that I learned from efficient running, all the stuff from your, your book, diet, taking care of your feet. You know what? That was something that I, I drastically underestimated before. And, uh, you know, maybe that's something to, like, to start the conversation. Why is it, and maybe it's a rhetorical question, but why is the, why is the foot so important to running and why do runners often overlook the foot what do you think well gosh it's a kind of a loaded question but i mean that your foot's your contact with the ground and there was an an article that was like an old physical therapy article titled this when your foot hits the ground everything changes <laughs> right so we, yeah so you're you know closed kinetic chain right so when we do strength training you know you, you want to be having foot on contract with the ground you know single leg uh, drills, single leg presses, single leg balance, single leg stability training with your foot on the ground because your foot controls your knee and your hip and your landing. So when your foot's weak and not responsive, you know, when you hit the ground, something's got to take the load. I think of your, you up there in Canada, you probably have a lot of these winter vehicles with big tires and shocks. But if, you know, if the foot's not responding, you know, and you're hitting rocks and different things, something's got to take that that shock and so you want your foot to be like that big monster truck tire to be able to deal with with the load and a well-functioning foot decreases the stress on your whole frame and, and most most running injuries are up the kinetic chain we would call it so it starts with your foot and you know up to your neck you know it's going to be your lower back your hips your knees you know so when when people have those issues we have to fix how they hit the ground first so they don't throw that kind of impact but it's a slow progress you know like a lot of people they're their feet are encased in these big, thick, supportive shoes from like age two. You know, and I'm sure in Canada, there's not a lot of barefoot time, right? Because it's cold <laughs> up there, right? So, you know, in the winter time, they're in these big, stiff boots and the feet, you know, can't really move. Yeah. So year after year, if something's not like, I mean, we all use our hands every day. So we don't have, uh, 
you know, if you were in Canada and you looked up handiatrist, there is no such thing, right? Because people's hands yeah. are fine, but there's probably, you know, hundreds and hundreds of podiatrists that you can't get in with, right? Because of the healthcare system and the weight. But we, we shouldn't need all these podiatrists. Like, what's wrong with our feet that we need all these doctors for the feet? When we don't have doctors for the hands, other than if you have a bad day with a kitchen knife, right? Like you have some traumatic or congenital, but all, all of our, our foot issues tend to be self-inflicted, you know? So yeah, the foot's like, yeah, it's super important. I mean, it's, it's 26 bones, 33 joints, a hundred muscle tendon insertions. So there must be something magical. And I couldn't begin to tell you the function of every one of those structures because that would <laughs> it'll be, be a test on it later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, even Da Vinci's studying this and he's a genius. He's trying to figure it out from an engineering perspective. He's like, well, how does this work? Right. And then maybe we can build better machines. Well, well, Dr. Mark, you, you, you have a, like a, a long running career. I think you have been running since uh, you, you were young and you were a pretty fast runner. I think you're uh a 224 marathoner, correct? Yeah, I've done 224 a couple times. You know, 224 a couple a times. Day job. <laughs> so, but yeah, I was hurt all the time too. So if you could go back and do it again, maybe I didn't understand much about much, but we all just trained hard, you know, back in those days. You know, no super shoes, that's for sure. No super shoes. And then... And I imagine uh, the technology was a lot different back then too. Um is this, are you a runner with a GPS? Do you use a Garmin or what kind of technology do oh, you gosh, use now? I person use, like, yeah, I, I can't even figure that stuff out. The only time I use a Garmin mark is if I have to go like measure a course because as Todd knows, Fair I enough. direct these races. So we'll go out and kind of Garmin them roughly before we'll more accurately measure courses with wheels. So if, if I need to get a, a measurement on something, I'll wear a Garmin, but you, you know, I, I to me, it's like one other thing. I want to go out and just meditate and, you know, clear my brain and, and do those things when I run more, listen to so something. It's not, the more it's of a theorist than when it, I'm going. Because yeah. <laughs> then you get depressed as you get older. Right? So. Well, that kind of goes into uh, my next question. So do you think uh, maintaining that connection to nature and the simplicity of running without all these devices telling you to speed up or slow down or your heart rate's too high, do you think that overly complicates things and may lead more to injuries or what, what do you think on that? Yeah, I guess it's a good question. I think it depends on, on the person, right? So people who are like type A and they always want data, I think that that bill will come due, right? Because if, if they're constantly striving to hit some data point and not listening to their body, but some people find joy in, in like they're, they're in a challenge group and they want to cover X amount of miles and that brings them joy, that challenge. So I, th I think if it's, making your activity, whether you're running or jogging or running, you know, if you like that and it's making it more enjoyable, then, then use the technology. But if you're finding that that's something that, that adds stress to an activity, which should, the rest of your day is stressful enough. You don't need your exercise to add more stress unless you're a professional athlete, right? Then they should be, right? The rest of their day is relaxation. So certainly all those people are quantifying everything, you know, Tour de France riders, you know, because that's their job. But I don't think many people on your podcast here running is their day job and, and they get to have, you know, cold plunges and massages the rest of the day. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think everyone who's been like a slave to those things should do an experiment, like just shut off the stuff for like three months. Right. It's like when you stop answering your email like every hour. Right. And, and then you're like, oh, well, that's good. Right. I only check my email twice a day. Yeah. I can no, get more I, stuff done. You know, I'm only like only I don't have all notifications off. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah oh, it's, that's it's, good, right? it's the overthinking sometimes. I saw that too. Like, so I've been running for a few years. And when I first started running, I was a slave to the watch. I was always watching the pace and trying to hit a pace I had no context for. And you, you, you said, Mark, uh, the bill comes due and the bill that the, the bill did come due and and you, you run yourself an entry and it is really fun when you can get out there and disconnect. I think it was uh, Steve Magnus and, and Brad Stolberg. They talk about, um, does the, uh, does the technology run you or do you run the technology? And, uh, a lot of those type A runners and we have type A's up here in Canada. Maybe I'm a recovering type A Dr. Mark, <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, it, it can actually run you. And, uh, 
to d disconnect it from a few months. I don't know if uh, there's a lot of people that could actually do that. I, I, it'd be tough. I know for me, I just cover my watch now and I try to go for a run and I don't look at it. And I find it amazing that you don't need to walk uh, look at it anymore. At, at least that's a simple kind of first step into maybe going cold turkey and turning it off. Yeah, I think the heart rate, if you're new, a heart rate monitor without all the other technology is good because a lot of people just, they don't understand what easy is, right? Because they're type A. So easy for type A people is I'm not in severe pain. Right? So they go out, <laughs> well, this is easy. And they're like, but like, no, no, because they don't understand what physiologically easy is, you know, Floris and his, you know, Phil Maffetone methods. But no, like, like the thing will beep and you'll be like, stop, slow down. And that'll drive people crazy. But sometimes you need that little bit of a cue just to get you to slow the F down, right? And then, then you don't need it anymore, right? So after you've realized, okay, I should be breathing through my nose. I should be calm. I don't need the, the heart rate monitor to tell me that, but that's a, it's a teaching tool. But then, you know, then you shouldn't continue to need it for forever because once you've developed that sense, but learn the sense. And if you're hurt, talk to someone, okay, why are you getting hurt? Are you training too hard, too much, something structural? You know, it's it's never the shoes, right? Oh, it's bad shoes and the <laughs> shoes. But, you know, why people get hurt in running is different than in hockey. You know, in yeah. hockey, you get hurt because someone hits you. You know exactly <laughs> what comes at you. In running, well, they're called intrinsic injuries. They're overuse injuries from many different factors, including nutrition, as Todd said. You know, if you don't eat well and recover and sleep well, your body can't heal, you know, from training and, and your resiliency to injury is going to going to be less. Well, you know, in Canada, we actually do have a, a sort of running where you body check each other out there. It's kind of like a hockey that we're, tr we're trying to start it. It hasn't really caught on more than just Mark and myself, but <laughs> yeah, but like a full contact thing where you're, you're guards, everything. No, it's good. That, that would be fun. You know, as long as you're not on ice and less, maybe like yeah. a spike. Goes the spikes. On. Well, you touched on something, Dr. Mark, and it's all about running easy. And I think that's something for the, the new runners. Why is it so important to learn to run easy? Like from a physiological perspective, what does running easy do to the body? And why is it important for the new runners to pay attention to, to ensure they're running easy? Yeah, so to get to like a little basic science level, but most people have heard of what are called mitochondria, right? So, so mitochondria are in every plant and animal. Mitochondria is where we make energy, right? So the, the more robust your mitochondria are, the more you can make energy, not just when we run, but when we think and for our longevity, how we live. So slower running is the most important stimulus or walking or hiking or whatever that activity is, is the best stimulus to grow your mitochondria, to make more mitochondria. And these mitochondria are designed to use fat for fuel. So think of like a hybrid car where if you're going really fast, you're in the gas pedal you know, you're passing someone on the interstate, but then you're in kind of cruising mode and it's electric and you can go all day in electric. So our bodies contain, especially up there in Canada in the winter, we've got a lot of body fat, right? That's our most efficient form of fuel. And when we're in that conversational pace, we're using fat for fuel. So that easy walking, easy jogging is actually the best stimulus to grow more mitochondria and to make them adapted to use fat for fuel. And that's human health. It has nothing to do with, you know, fast, fast running. But at the end of the day, it does help you run faster because the more mitochondria you have, the more you make energy at slower and faster paces. So if people think they can biohack or, you know, all this stuff, you know, seven minutes to fitness, it's not true. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, like, no, it's not true. You know, I, I don't know how they make this stuff up because like the, there's no data that that helps, you know, overall physical fitness. It's better than sitting on the couch, but, you know, at, at, like any professional athlete in any sport always does what's called like 80, 20, 80 and a cocky too, right? Ton of easy activity. They have massive aerobic engines so they can play these long games. And then they have short bursts of like high intense activity, but, but they have what's called a very high VO2 max. And that's developed, you know, from age six by playing out on the ice in the winter time, <laughs> you know, and like just with the French, you know, hours and hours of skating around, you know, develops that. So 
There's no biohack. The only way to grow mitochondria, to make more mitochondria, is exercise. Is exercise. So exercise is the magic pill. People can talk about different diets and burning fat, burning carbs, but it's all happens in the mitochondria. But the only way to make more mitochondria is exercise. And no kidding, pharma is trying to figure this out, right? Because there's a drug for everything because big pharma wants to control you and your life. They yep. want you on board and they want you a customer, but yet there is not a single drug that will help you make more mitochondria. The only way that to do good. that is to move your butt. <laughs> Get, you don't have to run. It can be like anything. Right? That was going to be my question. Uh, no injections yet for mitochondria. So oh, it doesn't like, exist. So here are these things, you know, like exercise in a pill, like you like type that in your Google and you'll see some rat study where they give them something in it. And what that is, is they're trying to show that it makes more mitochondria. And really they haven't gotten too far in rats yet. So uh, I think we're pretty far from like the human studies of this, but why, you know, heck, why do you need a freaking pill? Just go out and get in nature. Yeah. You can't get bit. any or, simpler you know, than that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just going to say too, um, it's, I, I like what I'm hearing because I have a lot of fuel. Uh, it sounds like that I'm able to expel if I, you know, get the right amount of mitochondria going there. So, um, but I think that's from a lot of easy eating over the years. Um, so it sounds like if I can do some easy running um, and maybe control, maybe do a little more complicated eating uh, to focus more on the nutrition side, then I can get a little bit more of a balance there, uh, which will help me and uh, you know my journey towards being a little more healthier. So in terms of overall nutrition, um, what would you recommend for uh let's say a new a new runner like myself um so just to give you a little bit of background um i know we talked a little bit before we hit record here but i've been running for maybe about eight months now uh, i've enjoyed it along the way um like most people as we were talking about earlier maybe type a folks i started out a little bit too fast um, maybe I would injure a knee or just you know take a couple of weeks off and then get back to it but the important thing is is that i'm still at it right now, which is good. Uh, so still in motion, uh, whether even in this cold uh, weather that we're experiencing right now, I'm finding myself on the treadmill. I know we also call it the dreadmill, but it <laughs> is uh, something that, again, keeps me in motion and um, until things get a little bit warmer and safer outside to run. So in terms of even high level, is there any kind of recommendations for nutrition, uh, things that us new people should be taking into consideration? in order to you know, heal well after uh, a run or anything like that? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. And certainly I, I can drill it down pretty simple. So I, I think people, you know, now like the nutrition science is completely insane, right? Because you have drug studies, you know, you've got the vegan mafia who say we shouldn't eat animal products. And you have this whole Northern tier Canadians who've never seen a plant their whole life. And they're probably the healthiest humans in Canada, right? So they have perfect mitochondria. You go up to the, the Northern tier and they basically, they hunt and maybe gather a few things. So all of us, so your, your DNA and your genetics are probably different than an Inuit like Northern Canada. So everyone really should be eating toward their ancestral nutrition. You know, so if you're out of Africa, you're hunting and the healthiest people out of Africa eat a, a native diet to their ancestry, which is they hunt, you know, the Maasai six foot seven, right? They're basically carnivores. And if you gave them a basketball, they would beat the Lakers, right? They're warriors. They don't even need guns, right? They're perfect. Per they've studied them, you know, and, and you, you go to any like the central, you know, middle America, U.S., right? The, the native Cherokee. Right. They were, again, six foot seven. And if you look at pictures of them in museums, like they were badasses. Right. They took out the U.S. Army with spears. Right. So they ate carnivorous. Right. But then, you know, you're going to have someone more toward Mediterranean. They're going to probably have more fish and maybe some more plants, more native plants. So there's not one perfect way of eating, but it, it comes down to not eating processed junk food. So the trifecta to create an ill human is how we're feeding humans in America and Canada and basically most of the industrial world, which is added sugar, white flour, and vegetable oil. I mean, these are called processed foods, right? They're highly refined processed foods. And you have a similar kind of food guide pyramid or plate that America does that, that tells you to eat all these grains and breads. And, and you have a, just about as high a diabetes rate as we do in this country. And if type 2 diabetes, 
So if you don't eat carbohydrates, type 2 diabetes does not exist. So if your genetics are trending to central obesity, meaning weight in the middle, which is the first switch to type 2 diabetes, doesn't matter how much you're running, you got to get rid of the carbohydrates. But you eat the real foods, right? So like, you know, I'm in a, a state that it's not near fish. So I have local farmers that I buy meat from their farm and I get chickens from the farm, you know, and like I'll get cheese from the grocer, you know, and get seasonal plants. But like I do the best I can to get everything that I eat, you know, from one of my neighbors, you know, other than in the winter seasons, you know, then I'll get some frozen vegetables because it's hard to get local vegetables in the winter because it's cold. But that's don't, don't overthink it. So get rid of the processed junk food. Now, you guys have in Canada a, a pretty much a neighbor to you all is Dr. Jason Fung, who's in Toronto. So maybe put just look up Dr. Jason Fung. He wrote the obesity code, the diabetes code, a fellow Canadian who's a nephrologist, meaning a kidney doctor. Mm -hmm. And when he was realizing all of his dialysis patients, which is kidney replacement, kidney failure, were all these diabetics, and he's wondering, what the heck? Why are all these people diabetics? So he started studying nutrition. So his goal is not is to put himself out of business, you know, not treat all these diabetes. It's a 100% preventable condition. And that's the focus of, of my medical work and research is type 2 diabetes, making it go away, not medicating it, because big pharma wants you to medicate it. They want you to think, oh, you can eat what everyone else eats and you guys have direct to consumer drug ads in Canada uh, or no actually you don't only New Zealand and the US so in the in the US you know the big every ad is like big pharma wanting to big sell pharma. you a med fortunately you don't see that and you do have a national healthcare system but the bank of the national healthcare system now is devastated you know in Canada and the UK by type 2 diabetes that's why you can't get a regular appointment like there's the poor health of your population in your country and our country is breaking the bank of the economy. We can't afford poor health of people. If people were healthy, you know, we would be here as doctors to treat your sprained ankle. Hmm. That's about it, right? Like everyone's well. There's no chronic disease. Right? So the first Canada the U.S. healthcare bill is chronic disease. Chronic disease is not treatable by medication. You got to get at the root cause, you know, trauma, acute illness, you know, that's where modern medicine has shined, but chronic disease were a complete disaster. So, I'll, but I'll stop there. No, that's great. Yeah. And I, I just know I need to get away from uh, you know, finishing, like finishing my uh, kids' plates <laughs> at dinner time, right? So <laughs> unless yeah, it's the good stuff, stuff, then we're okay. No sugar drinks, like the no sugar, sugar drinks. drinks. Yeah, With I'm good there, but don't use all that. I I find the biggest challenge that when you talk, and I, I, I totally agree. Like when you think of the, the the health guidelines, they're out of whack. And when you talk to to everyday people, they keep talking about healthy grains, and they don't realize that grains mean carbohydrates, right? So, and that's what we're trying to minimize. Correct? It's it's not healthy to have ninety percent of your energy coming from grains and oatmeal and all of this like potatoes and starchy vegetables. Is that, is that true, Dr. Mark? Yeah, for most, like if you're an 18 year old kid on the hockey travel hockey team, you're burning through fuel like crazy, right? And you're 18 and you're not diabetic. But if you're, I'm 57. So as we get older, our hormonal milieu changes. So if, if you're listening to this and you're putting, we're designed to use fat for fuel. It's the most efficient form of fuel, right? So you can make it through a couple of days without food. We're designed to use fat for fuel. We don't need an aid station every six hours to survive. So you want to train your body to the way it's designed, right? Whether you're running, right? You want to get rid of the big bulky shoes and teach your body how to move as, as we learned how to move. This isn't wacko or woo-woo stuff. This is just human evolutionary biology and biomechanics. But especially the heart and the brain love fat for fuel because we make ketone bodies. So we're designed to, to run on fat, you know, which is our own fat. And, you know, then you fuel up every now and then. But, you know, if you're just relying on and most of these things called grains now that are in your grocery store are highly refined. They're not because it's winter there now. You know, so if, you know, you have like ancient grains and, you know, something with absolutely no preservatives that if you didn't eat it by lunchtime, it would become like a hockey stick. Right. Like it, you go to 
syrup and they're different flours and those grains and they're really hard crusty breads and you can't eat that much they're, those flours are different than most of what we would call grains that you'd get at your supermarket which have a lot of uh, preservatives including uh, shortening and vegetable oils so they don't get stale and there's added sugar like they're they're not no protein in these foods so in my opinion that would especially if you're prone to diabetes if you if any of you listening to this have prediabetes or diabetes that means your body can't handle carbohydrates that's the problem so you have to think of it like this if my body can't handle carbohydrates i'm allergic to carbohydrates mm-hmm. what shouldn't you eat <laughs> carbohydrates <laughs> But have you made some dietary change, Todd, since you came to that camp? Just, I mean, even not being a a patient with diabetes, you know, just on how you perform and how you fuel during runs. Like you did a 50 mile run. Like what, what have you experimented with? Because everyone is their own experiment. There's not like one road to Rome, you know, everyone figures out themselves. Absolutely. So um, leading up to meeting uh, 2019 to go to the camp, I would say that I was heavy on the carbohydrates. I would carry a little bit of weight in my midsection. Um, if I would get done a run, I'd come back and I'd have a giant smoothie. You know, you're talking um, a lot of fresh fruits in there, uh, honey, all kinds of stuff. I was It was a lot of sugar. And I think I, when I went to the camp, there was two things. One is to understand what low carb or lower carbohydrate intake actually meant. And I think you actually gave us a, the, the finger t- uh, the finger test to have a, some blueberries, a banana. And we would we would tre- uh, check our uh, yeah, we check your glucose, yeah, check our glucose, and uh, you would see it shoot right up. And so I took away was you know start to cut down the carbohydrates. I estimated I was probably doing two to three hundred, maybe four hundred grams of carbohydrates oh, cool. every day. Yeah. Maybe I got down to about fifty to seventy five, and maybe after Christmas here. I got a little bit around the weight, so I know <laughs> the carbohydrates uh, were a little bit higher. And I could tell that for me right now. Like I, if I eat a, a few cookies for a week, boom, I'll put on five pounds like automatically. So my body loves carbohydrates. The second thing I learned was um, the vegetable oils. So we never thought too much about it. And uh, you, you taught us a little bit about um, the inflama- inflammation that came from some of the seed oils and to go to a, a, an olive oil uh, base and I switched everything to olive oil 2019. I, I swear it was about a month after that, uh, after the camp, I came back and I, I could see me, sh- I could, sh- I could, sh- I could, sh- I shed a bunch of fat that was on me where I saw veins where I never saw veins before. And, um, yeah, probably a month, two months, I, I basically lost probably like five or 10 pounds of this body fat that I was just hanging on to all the time. And it was, it came from cutting the carbs down to a healthier level. And getting rid of all those those seed oils. So, what 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 is it about the uh, the seed oils? Like, what what do they do to our bodies? Because it, it's something that I experienced firsthand. I can't say everyone would experience it, but I, I saw something. I could couldn't quite explain it. Yeah, the seed oils are are cause uh, what's called reactive oxidative species in in the liver. So they're called RRS. So the seed oils are essentially liver toxins, and they can start to trigger the diabetic state, which makes the insulin response of the carbohydrates higher and insulin stores. So anything that's a liver toxin, be it fructose, which would be in a sweet drink, or seed oils. So so the liver is kind of captain of the ship, right, (laughs) in metabolism. But it's it doesn't get any respect because it's not sexy like the heart. You know, you got the heart docs, you got the brain docs, and the neurosurgeon. It's got a liver of a lion. (laughs) No one is like because the liver, like, uh, we don't. Liver's not sexy. We don't want to be a liver guy because the liver, like, like it has to filter all this stuff. So the combination of sugar and seed oil creates what's called fatty liver. In fact, okay. like all those people you see at the supermarkets with belly, you know, with a waist, right? They've got fatty liver. And if we checked all of their metabolic markers, you know, their hemoglobin A1C, their triglycerides, it's off the rails. And their body doesn't make energy efficiently when you have fatty liver and that, that syndrome, right? Your body can't make energy and you get tired and you got to eat more carbs and then you get more tired. So how was your energy after like a month into that when you lost that five or 10 pounds, you know, not by being hungry, just by shifting that? Did you find that you could go for a run, Todd, and not like 
carbo load before and carbo load after? Did you find like your energy system started to change a little bit? In absolutely. How... You're, yeah, absolutely. I, I noticed that. Um, even yeah, through I, the I, day, I, like even like energy. when you're going to work, right? Like yeah. just. Yeah, great energy. Great energy during uh, the day. Uh, I would I would do fasted runs before I would take gels during my runs. Then I would switch to a little bit of fasted runs. As long as, as I was running easy, running aerobically through breathing through the nose, able to do two, three hours with minimal, minimal uh, fuel um, and, and, and refueled afterwards in, a, in about a 30 minute window, try to eat some protein um, to recover well. But yeah, I, I noticed how I felt. I felt a lot better, a lot of less foggy brain, a lot of less like getting tired. And looking back, um, and even now, like if I have a heavy carbohydrate, it feels good for a few minutes and then the crash comes. Yeah. And you can feel that crash. And once you felt that, you you know the difference and you and you try to stay away from that. And then I go into a the JFK and I think I fueled the JFK with about six um Maritan gels. That's all I had. Six or seven Maritan gels once I, about once an hour. I, I finished in twelve hours and I didn't finish because or I didn't hurt because I was out of fuel or anything. I felt fine. I probably could have had a little bit less. So yeah, like it is amazing how far um our fat can carry us. Like I'm first hand experience. Um, but it took a long time to like to start to get that fat adapted. It wasn't necessarily overnight, but um I, I saw a lot of health benefits of, of really cutting those carbs down, Dr. Mark, and it was invaluable advice. And like I said earlier, maybe it's a question. Why is it that you can have a couple of cookies and it feels like you put weight on right away, <laughs> but then you'll, you'll run for a week and you'll stay the same weight. Like, what is it about like those carbs that for me, maybe it's just the way I process the carbs. It seems to go to fat right away. Is that true? Well, they, the, when you eat the carbs, you hang on to more water. So carbs okay. make your pancreas release insulin. Okay. Insulin is a storage hormone. Right? So when insulin is up, you're storing, and that's part of our survival process. But insulin also makes you retain salt and water. So okay. if you were like mostly on a carbohydrate-reduced diet, you know, a lot of meat, a lot of fish, then you have like a, we have what's called like Thanksgiving dinner, right? You got this big carby dinner. And no one is, uh, you know, we play American football. So everyone's playing football before Thanksgiving dinner. And after Thanksgiving dinner, you know, all the, the dudes are sitting on the couch, like in a food coma, right? And they're all kind of puffy, right? Because that, that, that glucose stimulates the insulin, which makes you hang on to kind of more water. So you wake up the neck, you feel kind of bloated. And uh, that's not a good feeling, right? Like no. the the, you like the sugar because your brain's happy, but then an hour later, you're like, oh, I don't feel good. You never want to go for a run after that, right? Like you're like, no. oh, the last thing you want to do because your body is storing energy. When insulin is low, right, you're eating, maybe you're semi-fasted, you wake up in the morning, you haven't eaten since dinner the night before, insulin is low, your body is making energy from your own body fat. And you're like, you wake up, and if your body can do that, you know, the people who have adult diabetes, their bodies can't use fat for fuel at all. They're like injecting insulin into themselves 24 hours a day. So they're just storing, storing, storing all day. Like they never wake up and feel like going for a run as much as their doctor will yell at them and say, you need to exercise more. But like, it's not possible because their body's hormones are saying, I need to store. You can't store and burn at the same time. So you want to be, you know, like a you know, a bear in the spring, right? You're out hunting, right? So that's not, not storing up for the winter. And that's, that's right. just good physiology, right? That's weight neutral. You're just making energy from your body fat. And like those gels you took, Todd, can help stabilize your blood glucose because dripping in a little glucose, you know, you burned in 50 miles, you know, so those six gels are, you know, 700 calories total, right? They're like 120 calories each. Yeah. But you're burning like at, at you know at your size, you're you're burning like 150 calories a mile. So yep. so like the, those that glucose you took doesn't come close to your energy needs. So you fueled that 50 mile run mostly off your body fat, and you're just taking a little bit of glucose because your brain likes a little bit of glucose. When you get low blood glucose, your brain always wants you to survive. So if you have low blood glucose, 
you're going to feel like you're bonking, right? Is that, okay. use that term in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. yep. You're like, oh, I've hit the wall or whatever it is. But no, you just need a little bit. You have plenty of energy. Nobody hits the wall, right? Like, how do you hit the wall? You have enough energy to run. I can run from here to Toronto on my body fat if I'm in the right zone. But you feel like you're done because your glucose gets a little low. And you take you could take a candy or a Jolly Rancher or something. Slow down, take a little glucose, a little hit of Gatorade or Coke. You know, at the end of these ultras, you know, they always have the little bit of Coke, not a big gulp. Coke was like fantastic ounce, at the end. Four ounces, oh, yes. a little bit of Coca Cola is like rocket fuel. That's just right. That's for right. your brain. So you're, you're bang on. I think as we came off, you, you're on the country roads as you're getting close. Uh, and yeah, there's like Coca-Cola and you're like, oh, that's good. it's got a little caffeine. That's right. Too. I had a little bit of that Coke and then off we you go. It like brings you back from the dead. It's good. Yeah. It's getting dark. So what I'm hearing then as a new runner is that after 5K, I shouldn't go home and slam a bucket of KFC. Um, <laughs> no. I should not be. And the other thing it's is, is that, and we need to find a way to make the liver sexy again. Really, right? Because it is just, you know, one of the organs that's just not getting enough love. So, okay, that makes sense. Okay. And I'm a, I'm a, a GP, you call them in your country, but family doc, but my, my medical specialty is mostly metabolism and obesity. So, so I'm always looking at the liver markers and we see people's livers like come back from the dead after like six months going on carbohydrate reduction because they have these big fatty livers, right? And they're, the patient's like, well, I guess. It's just the way it is. It's because I'm fat. It's like it should be called carby liver because the you get a fatty liver from two different toxins. Alcoholic fatty liver, which would be from that uh, nice vodka you have up there or the, you know, what's, what's the favorite beer, the Molson. And you have <laughs> non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is a different uh, five carbon uh, sugar called fructose. Okay. So when the 12 year old has the fatty liver and you know, the mom swears he's not drinking dad's hooch. That's from <laughs> the juice. But now we see way more fatty liver in people that don't drink alcohol because of the drinks, the fructose. So, yes, they're liver toxins. And you, the liver is crazy because it can be done, like 80% of it destroyed, you know, by alcohol or fructose. And if you're young enough, it can come back from the dead. There aren't like if you did that to your brain, if 80% of your brain was done, I'm sorry, game over. 10% <laughs> of your brain was done. But the liver is crazy. Like it can come back. So I'm telling you this, you know, Mark and Todd, to give you hope. Someone says you have fatty <laughs> liver and you think that's the way it is. No, you can make that go away. Like the liver is resilient. It's like a bad weed, you know, it, keeps come, it can come back. <laughs> Which like is. Abuse. That's no, that's really good to hear. So what kind of time frame that I know you mentioned six months, you could see some improvements for somebody who goes down to a low carb uh, diet, but for somebody who let's say their liver is 80% gone, what would it take or what kind of time frame? I guess it really depends on the diet, like you mentioned, but really speaking, youth of the patient, but you know, six months to a year, we, we see people completely reverse fatty liver. Now that up to a point, once the liver has had like really severe fatty liver, it starts to get fibrosis, which is kind of a later, once you start to get these later stage changes, then not so much, right? And the number one indication now for liver transplant isn't alcoholic fatty liver, it's non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is really sad. You know, these are youth, right? And unless they understand the diet, they'll destroy their liver transplant. And the sad mm. truth is, because now there aren't many healthy livers anymore. So the transplant right? so uh, population is going down. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a sad reality because like, yeah, you guys don't have a lot of motorcycle riding in the winter, but there's not many healthy liver organ donors anymore. <laughs> so people will wait and die on a liver death. transplant list because no one has a healthy liver anymore. No, not to be morbid. That's for another other podcast, right? These <laughs> that's for part two. <laughs> so just go eat, go eat shit, right? This isn't a nutrition podcast, but that's go it. eat your ancestral way of eating, like ancestral Canadian, way of Canadian. eating. Ancestral uh, way of eating. Go hunt seal and caribou, <laughs> right? Get some good chicken eggs. Listen to Jason Fung. He's he's my man there. Jason Fung. We're, we're going to take that away, and we'll we'll dive into Jason and see what that's all about for sure.
Yeah, I mean, there's a huge low carb movement in Canada. Like, it's it's huge. You know, and the the Canadian Diabetes Association has acknowledged carbohydrate reduction as uh, the primary way to make type two diabetes go away. Right? You can make it type two diabetes go away. We could take your stomach out, and you can make it go away. <laughs> or you can reduce carbohydrates in your diet and make it go away. So which sounds like a better option? <laughs> I'm going to go with option number two on that one. I yeah, option number two, yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't get us on TV, though. We wouldn't be on that TV show where... Uh... <laughs> well, okay, so Dr. Bark, so we, can, we, get our, we get our diet now. So we're a new runner or we're uh, maybe a, a mid-packer who's looking to improve a little bit. We got our diet under control. We cut down the carbohydrates. We're eating our ancestral diet: meat, eggs, fish, some um, you know healthy plants that you can find in a hundred mile radius to where you are. So we got that under control. Now we're going to start on the training side of it. Um, we talked about the the, the aerobic training, uh, the easy running, um, but something that I that I really learned from you was the the low heart rate training, the Maffetone training, and I think I read it. The story, or I heard your story talking about, you came across this from reading an article on an airplane from Mark Allen that talked about low heart rate training. What from that article, like surprised you? And if you look back, do you think there was any destiny that that article was waiting in the airplane for you? Because look what you've done since that article and your career, your running, everything that blossomed because of that. Do you believe in fate, Dr. Mark? Was it fate to see that article in the in the airplane? Gosh, you know, that's a, a crazy interesting question because, you know, just by grabbing that article, you know, it was Mark Allen, it was called Get Fast, Run Slow or something like that. Like I'm a doctor and, and I've been competing and running and we didn't know anything about exercise physiology at all, right? No, no one ever talked about mitochondria or like we just went out and ran hard, right? That's why we were on the team. And I'd been hurt. I, I just uh, I was in kind of recovery from foot surgery at the time. So it was like a perfect time to say, oh, I thought I was done running, period, just from my foot surgeries. You know, like, well, this doctor say, well, you're broken, your feet are trashed, and we got to fuse your toe joints and all this. You know, oh, you my. Um, so it was like, oh, maybe I'll try this, you know, and, and because it, it just made sense. And uh, yeah, that connected me, you know, gosh, I've done like six or seven courses with Dr. Phil Maffetone, you know, reached out to Dr. Phil Maffetone, who like changes your life, right? Because he's like Yoda, right? So like, like there are a few people in the world that I think are like Yoda, like who, if they say something is true, I'm not going to argue. I'm going to go read an experiment and then go back to them. Say, Dr. Okay, Mark is our Yoda. So, and Dr. Maffetone too, but no, but Dr. Mark, you're our Yoda. <laughs> like Dr. Tim Noakes and Phil Maffetone, you know, these people are like, yeah, they're like that. They know before they come out and say, I think something is true. Like they've experimented on themselves and hundreds of others, including world-class and recreational. And, and they, yeah, this is the way it is. And they make it make sense. And they're like, yeah, that makes sense. So, so, so yeah, I mean, probably all of us at some point in time have read something that's like, yeah, I need to do that. <laughs> Whether yeah. it's something mindful or spiritual or, you know, with your exercise or relationships, it's like, ah, oh, it gives you, that makes sense. And then you go read and discover, right? It's not like that one thing, like you believe it and you buy in and you're like, oh, I'm all in, right? No, you, you're going to go try it before you would ever share with anybody else. Hmm. Like, oh, I think this is true, right? I'm going to go try it. Now, you know, I bought a heart rate monitor. 20 years ago, right? And I'm running around this park in Denver. You know, I'm like 30 years old at the time and 180 minus your age, you know? So it was set at 150, I guess about what it was. And it would beep at like a 10 minute mile, right? And that's at that time, that's like, like shit, you know? But I, I was like, I'm runner, drinking the so, Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Then the next month, it's like, you know, nine minute mile and an eight minute mile at the same heart rate, seven minute mile, same heart rate. You know, I was running close to six minute mile at that heart rate in Denver. And, you know, I'd lined up for a marathon for the Air Force. I hadn't even like acknowledged that, that I'd want to run the race because I wasn't like training. And but someone was hurt and they reached out and I said, sure, I'd, I, I'll line up. And uh, it was the Marine Corps Marathon. I forget what year it was, maybe 20, 2001, 20, 2000 and went through halfway in like 115 pace. But usually you're working pretty hard. And I was like, this is weird. 
I'm like, I'm chatting with the person next to me. And then like, I closed the race and like uh one thirteen and finished in third place in this race. And there's like 25,000 people. But what was wild about it was like, usually you've done marathons, Todd, like you're done, right? Like I, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> you know, I never, went, but I, I, you finish that race and you're like, I could do that again. It was like a totally different experience right because you're like making energy you feel great and you're accelerating the last six miles you know that's that's fun and it was like never look back after that i'm like okay well, this just makes sense because like i didn't train hard i didn't do hard days i didn't do intervals uh, you know and I've, this worked and you know i'm coming off a of surgery i've been coming off surgery and you know run a pretty decent time you know and, and wake up the next day and be able to run again and not be so beat up but yeah yeah, so read so, anything by Dr. Phil Maffetone. I describe his method in my own book, right? So yeah, give give full credit to the people, you know, who have, you know, but 80-20 principles, like you could type in, you know, Dr. Steven Seiler, 80-20. So he's done all the research and exercise physiology, whether you're a Tour de France rider or cross-country skier, you know, in Canada, like 80% of your training is always slow, you know, relatively you know, but slow for a Tour de France rider is like really fast for you yeah. and I, but it's for them <laughs> metabolically, it's slow. Like a Kenyan, we call it zone two training. You know, Kenyan running easy, breathing through the nose is running a six minute, five minute mile, right? That's for right, us, right. it's like, like we're all gas. So like each, each person is relative to them, but yeah. So principles of longevity is, you know, the fast stuff and the hard stuff is like the icing on the cake. This is Arthur Lydiard, you know, going way back, you know, to the 1960s. Everything, every modern coaching principle is based on Arthur Lydiard's principle. So would you say, Dr. Mark, then um, the advice was, is the 80-20 or whatever it is, most of the time you're running very easy at a low heart rate. Does two questions. Do you actually need to do the harder stuff to get faster? to get ready for a race day or can you actually, do you really need that? Like how, like you see all the race plans out there, people like, I got to get my intervals. I got to my, my tempo Tuesday or my fart licks. Do you really need that? Or it, do you? Yeah. It's a great question. It depends. So the interval training is specificity. So if okay. you want to run your competitive track runner and you want to be able to run five minute miles for 10 kilometers on the track, you got to go do some work at five minute miles, not 10 kilometers at a time, but to be specific at that race pace and maybe a little bit faster, but not a high volume because you have to get the coordination. You have to work those energy systems, but it's okay. specific for competition. But if you just want to live a long life, you know, go do an ultra marathon, like, like what part of an ultra marathon are you limited by your speed? Are you ever limited <laughs> by your speed in the JFK 50? No. <laughs> you limited by your strength. So I think strength straight. training is important, especially I'm 57 as you get older, right? You, you need bang. strength, right? Yep. So mix up your strength training, but you don't need to do a lot of running at, you know, th three minutes a kilo to go yep. run a 50 mile race. Um, yep. no, but if I'm you're, you. you know, want to run a fast 5K, like say you want to run a 20 minute 5K and you're, easy pace, you know, is 10 minute a mile, you got to do some work a little bit to rehearse at that pace. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Where my mind goes with it is that, uh, so for those who are familiar with the low heart rate training and your, your math pace, like the pace that you can run at the, the target heart rate that you're set for. So for a guy like me, um, I can run maybe eight minute miles at my target heart rate pace. That's pretty fast. Like I, it's pretty fast for an old guy. Yeah, Forty six. I mean, you're, you're. That's. I'm very happy with that. Should I be able then, in theory, to go out and run a marathon at my math pace, and it shouldn't be that difficult? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I'll do a. a yeah, you a should if you're running eight minutes a mile at a heart rate of, one forty or something. Yeah, you should be able to. You, know, you should be able to do that for that. For three or to four hours. No, now 10 hours is different because you ultimately you'll get muscle breakdown. You know, it's not a fuel issue. You've done yep. JFK 50 mile, right? Ultimately your, your muscles start to take load and it's not an energy system issue. It's because you're, you're breaking down muscle. 
But no, you should be pretty comfortable going out and running that for a marathon. Take a little bit of fuel, like you say, to take a gel every hour just to keep your blood glucose steady. And then there's conditions, you know, trail, road, wind, yeah. weather, hot, cold. You know, so there's always conditions, you know, that we're, we're never in this optimal test tube condition when we're out there. You know, and, and people always say, okay, I want to run X time for these long races. And again, you're not in a controlled environment. Yeah, like totally the weather and the conditions come like, oh, I run this pace on an indoor treadmill at, you know, 60 degree temperature, you know, but like n you're not going to get that outside. And then they get all frustrated. People get frustrated. Get so yeah. tied in. Just, this is running for your audiences about fun, joy, community, meeting new people and, you know, living not just longer, but living well, right? Who wants to live long in the care home, right? We, you want to live long and die quick, right? So the stronger yes. we are, the more yes. we are, the less diabetes we have, the more, you know, you, you won't spend any time in the old folks home. You'll live in your yeah. own house, collecting your pension, and, uh, and <laughs> hopefully pass something on to your children, you know? And that's what you want. Yeah. Dr. Mark, I... I have to know, I know we're getting uh, close to the top of the hour here, but um, you've ran, well, you have quite the career when it comes to, uh, sorry, quite the running career. Uh, so you're 57 now, you've been running for decades. You've ran over 100 marathons and ultras uh, combined, I believe. Um, is there one race that stands out in your mind that when you're in a circle of friends talking about running, that you have a great story associated with one particular run? Uh, could be something unique happened, could be, you know, personal best or record uh, day. Um, what is that one run that you gravitate towards telling a story about? Yeah, I haven't really thought about that, but I think I think the hardest run I've ever done, which I probably learned more about myself, because I'm not, I, I came from a like track running background, you know, not these long, crazy runs, but during the, during COVID, you know, all, all the races were, were canceled and, you know, on a whim. And I think Todd met Katie. You know, yep. Katie Nolan, who was my partner in crime for the camps, and she's like an ultra runner. And, and she's like, oh, I signed up for the first 100 mile run that's going to be in my state of West Virginia. You know, and I say, like, so tell me about that. Oh, it's in the, the New River Gorge, which is this beautiful area of West Virginia. It's like a Grand Canyon of West Virginia. You know, so I went home that night and I, I, I called my friend James. And he's like, yeah, you know. Katie's doing this hundred mile run, you know, it seems kind of crazy, but what do you think? Are you game? And then like, we thought about it for like five minutes and we're like, okay, we're in, <laughs> we signed up. you know, I never run longer than comrades and JFK, but like that was totally out of like my wheelhouse to do this hundred mile trail run. And that was the hardest damn thing I ever, ever did. Cause it's not like I'm slow in these long, long, long ultras, but I, you know, I finished that thing and, and it was hard, but I, I learned a lot. And it was community because, you know, I had my uh, pacers and we went there as a, with Katie and my friend James and ran that thing together. And so, so that was just like, like everything was kind of depressed and shut down. And, and it was nice that, that that event went on and like you can do, do something out of your comfort zone. So, so that was way out of my comfort zone. But I finished and woke up the next day sore than I've ever been. I needed to, <laughs> you use, no kidding. I needed to oh. use my hiking pole, you know, the little the poles. You know? I didn't use them during, I didn't know anything about these trail ultras. I should have used the poles during the run, right? But like, I'm a runner, right? Runners don't use poles, right? Because I'm Yeah, stupid. Dr. Mark was going to lay down like five minute miles, he was thinking probably. <laughs> but like, I didn't know about these poles, right? You go to Europe, and you're only using these poles. But like uh, Katie had a set of poles. I couldn't even get out of bed. So I needed to use these poles. <laughs> That's I before, after. Right on my leg. Recovery poles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so later I could walk again, but. Uh, oh, wow. So the great thing about, the great thing about having a store though, is that you have access to all the new technology out there, I guess, when it comes to innovations with shoes and devices and things like that. So is there I'm anything. Innovation when it comes to. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I rotated. I went through like three pair of ultras and, and by the end of it, they all felt like shit because my feet were <laughs> like you go up a shoe size every aid station, you know. Oh, I imagine. When I finished. I'm like in a twelve and a half, and I've never worn a shoe that big. But I'm glad I brought a big pair for the final 
Yeah, These cultures are sounding really appealing to me right now. Um, hmm. <laughs> Sorry, not the right. cues, the ultra runs, uh, you know. Maybe like, that could be your first yeah. run, Mark. We could uh, talk you into a 100-miler. But yeah, the yeah, I start small, right? I, don't think I, I ran after, after probably mile 75. It was ruck marching, right? Like, it's oh, not a run. Like, so it's rebranded. Useless after that point. So it's, if you can walk fast... You know, and that's why this running stuff, you don't need to be running the whole, like run, walk, jog, right? Like a lot of these running events, you're always mixing. If you're a new runner, mix the running and walking because that's actually like, I'm sure Todd during the JFK 50, right? You you had a plan, like yes. you're going to walk a bit, you're going to run a bit. And that was your sustainable. If you tried to run the whole damn thing by like 25 miles, you'd trash. True. I mean, like what was your walk run strategy? Like from the get go. You know what? I, I, uh, I took your advice. I've heard your advice before about, uh, run until you're tired and walk until you're embarrassed. And I just kept repeating that. Like, I'd be like, it, it kind of worked well, but what I found amazing, Dr. Mark, is that Appalachian trail. People say that's runnable. The elites at the front of the pack are doing five hours and 20 minutes of the JFK. I don't know how they ran that thing. I was walking it, tripping over the roots. And I came off that Appalachian trail and my, calves and my quads were destroyed from coming downhill like I, i'm yeah. a flat runner so i got to that cno canal and i was so happy everyone's like oh that's gonna be the boring section i'm like no 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 this is heaven it's flat as a pancake and i can run forever but yeah i would basically i, I broke it up every kilometer and i mix it up i would go 500 meters running 500 meters walking maybe 700 meters walking 300 meters running i would just keep doing that every every kilometer keep it fresh um, and the secret was uh, you, you do walk a lot. That's the secret of the ultras, um, but you got to walk fast. And I learned that too. Yeah, that walk, was like advice that you give. Walk, walk with a purpose because you can make up a lot of time. And I was walking pretty fast, maybe 10 minute kilometers, of nine minute kilometers if I, if I walk with a purpose. And it wasn't too bad. So yeah, walking, I think for the new runner, that's something that they, they overlook right away. They think running, I got to go out and be able to run a 10K. You'll get there if you give yourself some time to catch up. And uh, there's no shame in, in walking a little bit. And uh, especially in those long events, you do end up walking a lot. Yeah, and if you're on a treadmill, mix up your walking, you know, if it's winter time. You know, Definitely walk. Well. Walk backwards too, you know, like walking backwards, you know, as long as you look where you're going, you know, you're using different, it actually helps your glutes and your hamstrings and kind of unwinds things, works your posterior chain. So, so practice that a little bit, like these long, like long steps backwards is actually really good. Definitely. And uh, if you're willing to come back in the future, perhaps you'll see my name change from Runkle Mark to Ruckle. Uh, I'll go on a Ruck, you know, uh, Mark coming <laughs> back. Some yeah, um, Ruck. Yeah. Why good. not? Um, so just in closing, uh, Dr. Mark, um, what is 2024 looking like for you? What do you have on the go this year? What kind of events? Uh, how are things with the store? Anything new happening? Camps? Uh, what, yeah, what do you have about camps, but we have, uh, I, I helped direct two races, one in the spring in May, which Todd has come to the Harper's Ferry half. And then we have another event in the fall and our events are community events. So we have short events, kids runs, and then up to full marathon. So it's kind of entry level, they're low cost. And, uh, you know, now running has become so commercial, you know, people pay crazy money to go run a 5k. So we want to be the opposite, just be kind of grassroots. You know, whether I'll go out and uh, compete in any events, I, I had my knee operated on this fall, you know, I had a, a, a tear in my cartilage, which wouldn't heal. So I'm finally running again now pain free, oh, which excellent. is nice. That's good. First, That's good to hear. Structural That's injury hear. so long, you know, since probably over 20 years ago. So, you know, but it's, it's fine, right? You, you embrace, okay, like I'm, you know, ellipticaling and walking, you know, but now I'm running again. So I'm pretty happy to not be in pain, but maybe in the fall, I'll jump into something, but I'm just ha like, it's all about, about joy and getting outside. So I've been up in the mountains, some recent weekends in the snow and able to go run in the snow. And, and that's, that's good. That's what it's all about. That's excellent. And, and you know what, Dr. Mark, you're bang on. Uh, I've done the Harper's Ferry half twice now. It is, I would say the most scenic and one of the toughest half marathons that Someone can challenge themselves too. It's fantastic. Highly recommend the Harper's Ferry Half. I haven't been yet to do the Freedoms Run. Um, maybe this year, if I don't sign up for the uh, the JFK, I might do that one again because I had so much fun down there. 
but both those runs are fantastic. And yeah, you know, back, for sure, it's it, it's beautiful. The, the the whole state is just long gorgeous nice for you, but it's yeah, it's nice. Yeah, we're from Canada, like nothing. We, we live in the middle of nowhere, so every everything's yeah, a long it's drive. Like, <laughs> drive for you is like oh, it's no problem. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and so uh, you know what. Cross country you, skiing up there now? Do you have snow on the ground? You know what? There's some good snow, and uh, as you get a little bit north, I would say probably about two hours from our house. That's where you can really get some good amount of snow, and people like a uh, will cross country ski, snowshoe, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful winter activity. Absolutely. Super low impact too on your joints. That's right. That's what my running at lunch today was. Basically, it felt like snowshoeing. I had my uh, giant shoes on with some traction, and I was just out bogging around in some snow it was a lot of fun out there and uh that's what it's all about and you know what folks if uh i would say i've been to a lot of uh, shoe stores a lot of running shoe stores i love supporting the local running shoe stores two rivers treads it's the nation's first natural running shoe store dr mark started it what about 10 years ago dr mark well almost 15 now it's almost goes, 15 i'm just by so crazy yeah it's got the coolest uh gear the coolest shoes and you know I, one thing that came out of my brain right before we leave here was when i look back i think you said that it's not your running shoes that have the biggest impact on you it's what you wear throughout the day and i was wearing like dress shoes to work and i got out of those dress shoes and into some lems and bought some lems, lems yeah the magical yeah put a link on the lems on we will. They are the best shoes. And that's all I've been wearing for the last four four years. I got my toe socks. I got my lens. Really strong, just walking around house or on. work or shopping or whatever. Heck yeah. And they're stylish. They look pretty good. So I don't know. Mark, you see me at work. Do you like my uh my lens? I look pretty stylish, I think. At least Wait, your Lulu lens or your <laughs> my Lulu lens. Yeah. Oh, yes. lemon shoes. Don't say have those. nice boots. A nice yeah. <laughs> Canadian boot, the boulder boots is Yeah. Very sure. Yeah. So we'll we'll link that we'll link uh, two of his treads in the in the show notes there and uh, you know what if you're in the area call Dr. Mark. Uh, the one thing really cool about Dr. Mark, uh, I could just say this: you, you are a busy guy. You're a doctor. You're a professor. You're a runner. You have a family. Like uh, you have a shoe store. You're you're educating people. But then you put yourself out there, and I see you on Facebook all the time, to inviting people to come on into two of his treads, and you'll help them. Um, Come on, the true form runner, and you'll help him kind of give some tools and techniques of how to run. Yeah, I, I got to give you kudos for that because uh, there's lots of people in life that don't put them, don't give back, don't put themselves out there, and and you're always doing that, Doctor Mark, and we really appreciate that. Us runners, uh, if you don't know Doctor Mark, I would say you're probably really new to running. For most of us, we know Doctor Mark, and we thank you because you're always giving back to the community and race directing you name it you're a great guy and uh from being selfish for a moment um i'm a much stronger runner and i'm still running and it's all because of you and and the stuff that you taught um so just to let you know that you're if you're putting this stuff out there people are absorbing it and taking it to heart and you are making them stronger and better runners so thank you dr mark we really i appreciate, I really appreciate that you, coming yeah, on. Well, you guys uh share the love you know it makes my day when when people are uh, finding joy so it's good absolutely. as you get absolutely. older like living is giving right so it's, it's living is given absolutely and not and not just to, and not to mention again this is only episode three so the fact that you came on episode three of the run your list show we are forever grateful so thank you again we'll, for your we'll time. do it again we'll get some questions from your listeners and we'll uh, absolutely. have an episode two for sure We'll do Absolutely. it. Thank you. We'll, we'll book you there. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mark. You have a, a nice warm evening and enjoy a nice glass of red wine. And uh, thank you very much. All right, thank Mark you. Todd. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks. <laughs>